Again, so yes, uh, th thank you for the introduction. And uh, we've got some great speakers lined up today, and I am very happy to be kicking things off today. Uh, so my name is Michael, and I am a senior technology analyst at ID TechX, which is a company based in the UK. And today I'll be giving you a broad overview of the current state of the vertical farming industry and how things look around the world, with the aim of hopefully framing some of the presentations that are to come. And so to begin, uh, Here's a little bit about more about ID Tech X and why it is I'm in front of you today. So um, ID Tech X is a market research and business intelligence company that specializes in emerging technologies. And so we take a deep look at both the science behind the emerging technologies and the markets in which they operate to try and get a clear view into what's really going on in what's rotten, fast moving and sometimes hype filled industries. And everything that I'm going to talk to you about today uh, comes from the recent ID TechX report, um, Vertical Farming 2020 to 2030, which is a report that looks into the technologies and markets that are helping to make vertical farming a reality across much of the world. So on to today's presentation. I'll begin by describing the current state of the vertical farming industry before giving an overview of what this looks like around the world, before finishing with, out, with an overall outlook for the industry. Um, so to begin with, what, do, what does the vertical farming industry look like right now? Well, in recent years, the vertical farming industry has been really taking off. Um, so since the idea was first popularized in the West, so Europe and the US a few years ago, uh, interest in the field has exploded with hundreds of startups being founded around the world and com companies raising hundreds of million dollars in, in investor capital. And each year, more and more vertical farming startups are being founded and their deals are getting bigger and bigger. And so if you look at this next slide, uh, this shows the three most well-funded vertical farming startup, uh, vertical farming companies out there right now, which are Plenty, Aero Farms and Infarm, uh, with Plenty and Infarm having announced some major investment deals within the last month or two, both of which over, were over $100 million. And of course, we're lucky enough today to be joined by Aero Farms, and I'm really looking forward to hearing a bit more about them and their work as well. And what this slide and the previous slide illustrates is the sheer level of interest this sector is receiving, um, having started from almost nothing in the West only five or six years ago. And quite a lot, there are an increasingly large number of people across the world who think that vertical farming has the potential to make a huge impact on food production. And this graphic here, uh, which is taken from the recent ID TechX reports on vertical farming, shows a snapshot of the entire vertical farming value chain. So starting from the companies that make the hardware that go into a vertical farm, say things like LED lighting, automation, and so on, with some companies uh, tailoring products specifically for vertical farming. Um, then going on to what we've called integrated vertical farming system developers. So that is companies that build the vertical farms themselves. And then those companies will either operate the vertical farms themselves and grow fresh produce, which they will then sell on, or they will develop uh, vertical farming turnkey vertical farming systems that can be bought by other people who will then run the vertical farms themselves. So for example, say freight farms who builds um, vertical farming uh, systems modeled on 40 foot shipping containers. And what this graphic shows is that um, over the past few years, a whole ecosystem is built around vertical farming, uh, representing numerous opportunities both up and down the value chain. Now this is all presents a very exciting, a very exciting uh, outlook and picture. However, despite the investor optimism and increasing numbers of companies starting up and involving themselves within the industry, vertical farming does still face a few challenges. Um, and the sector has seen its, its own fair share of bankruptcies, such as the high profile bankruptcies of Pod Ponics and Farmed here in North America. Now, the, in addition to this, the high profile problems might be also disguised in the number of much smaller companies that are going out of business underneath the radar. And a recent agrilist survey suggested that vertical farming was one of the least <laughs> profitable uh, forms of farming, with 73% of vertical farming companies surveyed having not made any profit. So what's going on here? Well, firstly, it's really important to bear in mind that vertical farming is a much newer industry than both uh, farming and greenhouse farming and greenhouse growing and so a lot of companies are still in the early stages of development whether that's equipment development or scale up and therefore we can perhaps not expect them to be as profitable as companies that have been established for many years 
However, beyond this, there are several major challenges that vertical farming farmers face that will be discussed throughout, throughout today. Uh, and they essentially boil down to the fact that vertical farms are often just really expensive to run uh, with issues such as labor costs and uh, the electricity costs being really quite dominant components. And as Marcel indicated earlier, something that could put Eastern, uh, Central and Eastern Europe into a really good position to, to be a good area of growth of vertical farming. Now, automation technology and advanced licensing systems and advanced HVAC systems can improve the efficiency of the farm and reduce labor costs quite significantly. But then they that has a trade off with the uh, increased upfront capex costs and can often uh, raise the, the initial costs of the vertical farm to levels which can't be justified for a smaller company, uh, creating an awkward trade off between investing a lot at the start and then ha having an easier time down the line versus not, not being able to do so and then facing logistical and organizational complexities later on. Um, scale up can also be quite difficult for a vertical farm with and many economies of scale can be lost and increased uh, by, uh, can be lost by increasing the organizational and logistical complexities of a larger vertical farming facility. Now, none of these barriers are insurmountable, and there's uh, a lot of interesting work going on around automation, and there are several interesting discussions around what the optimal size is for a vertical farm, and whether it's better to have small-scale, flexible production, or large-scale, highly efficient production. And this is all very interesting. But the conclusion to all of this is that the vertical farming industry is currently in a very exciting place. Uh, however, it is still facing its fair share of challenges. So let's move on to establishing a global picture of the vertical farming market. So the vertical farming industry is quite varied across the world and has a strongly geographical flavor to it. So in the West, so uh, the USA and Europe, basically, uh, the industry is fairly new and there's lots of startups out there that are currently raising lots of money. And the picture is slightly different in Asia. So in Japan, vertical farming is much more established as a concept, um, with there being around 200 vertical farms operating throughout the country. And the industry is less well developed in China, but it is still growing quite rapidly. Um, and there's a special case in this discussion for the Middle East, where the need for vertical farming is particularly pressing, uh, which is something I'll touch on in a little bit. So this slide shows some of the main consumer perceptions around vertically farm produce and how it varies with geography. So in the US and Europe, many of the benefits, uh, the consumer benefits center around the localness of production and perceptions of higher quality. Whereas in Asia, it shifts quite a bit towards food safety. So which have been quite big issues in uh, food safety and food consistency in both Japan and China. <laughs> and then uh, consistent issues across the world for vertical farming uh, is the fact that um, vertical, farm, vertical farm produce is still often uh, more expensive than conventionally farmed produce across the world, um, as well as the fact that cheap conventionally farm, farm produce is generally quite widely available um, outside of the Middle East, that is. So much of the interest of the last few years has come from the West, and in particular the US, where there's been a surge of Silicon Valley startups and some um, absolutely enormous funding rounds happening throughout the country. And although vertical farming in, in the US isn't as developed as it is in Japan, the level of investment and interest in the region are, helping to, are really helping it to grow very quickly. Um, this slide is slightly out of date with Plenty, who now have uh, over 500 billion in funding. Um, and so a driving factor that's somewhat unique to the US um, in terms of vertical farming is the ability of vertical farming to provide fresh produce. So in the US, almost all produce is grown in specific regions, particularly California, and therefore fresh produce can travel thousands of miles through multiple centralized facilities before it reaches stores in say New York or Chicago, uh, often taking several weeks in the process. And this can not only result in products that are less fresh, but it can also um, can lead to some issues with food safety. Um, and that's a, and contamination of leafy greens is becoming an increasingly important issue in the US, where there's been hundreds of hospitalizations over the last few years. Um, and this is primarily due to the fact that mo a lot of fresh produce, most fresh produce in the USA, um, ends up traveling through big centralized facilities where contamination can quite easily take place. And because vertical farming avoids uh, these large centralized facilities and could even potentially in, uh, involve a more distributed model of uh, 
fresh produce production. Uh, it could it could help bypass this issues of contamination, and this could be a key driver of the technology in the US, um, alongside the freshness and potential quality benefits. So the situation in Europe is quite similar to that in the US, with lots of startups being founded and increasingly not, uh, an increasing number of big money investment rounds. So for example, a uh, Berlin-based uh, Infarm has managed to raise up $300 million, which resulted in it being the second highest fund funding vertical farming company on the planet. Now, a lot of the uh, a lot of this in, in Europe so far has been driven within the UK and EU, with uh, players such as the Jones Food Company, who's talking later on, as well as uh, Urban Crop Solutions uh, in Belgium and Agricool in France, have been increasingly making uh, headlines with interesting deals that they're doing and partnerships and progress. So, and one thing I think is interesting to think about when we think about vertical farming in Europe and uh, just farming technology in general in Europe is quite how advanced it is. So, um, for example, greenhouse technology is very advanced in in Europe in particular, with the Netherlands in particular being a hot spot for greenhouse technology. And it's an interesting thing to think about because the Netherlands is uh, is apparently the world's second biggest exporter of agricultural products behind only the USA. Now. Given the Netherlands is 237 times smaller than the US, this shows how remarkably high Dutch farm productivity is. And in 2017, the Netherlands uh, exported about $100 billion worth of agricultural products. So this is all very interesting, but what's it mean for vertical farming? Well, first, much of the technology that has been developed for the the advanced greenhouses found in the Netherlands and, else, and elsewhere in Europe could be quite easily adopted for vertical, adapted for vertical farming. And there's already quite a lot in terms of um, automation, automation capabilities and technology for improving cost effectiveness of greenhouses that could quite easily transition to vertical farming. And hopefully once the vertical farming industry is sufficiently large enough, many of these companies will uh, begin, uh, begin working in the industry, forming partnerships with various ma major players. And in this context, the Dutch greenhouse industry could be a window into the future of vertical farming. However, one of the things to bear in mind is that the success of the Dutch greenhouse industry may not necessarily be a positive. So given that uh, greenhouses at the moment have much lower operating costs compared to vertical farming, uh, this could suggest that the vertical farming industry might struggle to compete. Uh, additionally, the greenhouse industry still has a lot of room to expand to places such as the US and China and might end up forming being a competitive industry um, in a sense. So moving on from Europe, the, the Middle East is a particularly interesting case of vertical farming, uh, particularly in the desert regions of the Gulf states where, where most of the land is unsuitable for agriculture, uh, meaning there is a, and there's a pressing need to preserve for, uh, water. And in these regions, almost all of the food is imported. And at the same time, electricity tends to be very cheap, meaning that uh, the Middle East could be particularly uh, well suited for setting up vertical farming. And so governments around the Gulf states are quite keen to reduce the dependence on imports. Uh, so, for example, in the UAE, the government offers extensive support for local food production, such as 50 percent subsidies on fertilizers, irrigation and seeds, as well as loans for machinery. And so this suggests uh, and in 2014, the UAE government announced a $27 million fund to support modern farming techniques, particularly hydroponic growth, again, which is optimistic for the vertical farming industry. And so the final uh, region that I'd like to highlight today is Japan. <clears throat> so although vertical farming is a relatively new topic in the West, it's been around for quite a long time in Japan. And there's currently more than 200 vertical farms operating throughout the country, although many of them are still at a small scale and uh, it's believed that the majority of them are still not profitable. So the drivers for the growth of vertical farming are slightly different in Japan compared to the West. And whilst consumers over there do value freshness, uh, in the small geography of the country, uh, coupled with the efficient, efficient, the highly efficient distribution network, make it less of a differentiator. And the, one of the key drivers is in Japan is food safety. So food safety is a very sensitive topic in the country, particularly following the uh, 2011 Fukushima disaster. And in addition to this, natural disasters and recent heat waves have caused quite large levels of fluctuation in the price and availability of fresh produce. And the reliability and consistency of vertical farming to provide a consistently priced um, product is something that, could, that is highly valued by consumers in Japan, in addition to the food safety benefits. And given that the uh, level of 
the level of establishment of the industry. Uh, the Western vertical farming industry could quite learn quite a lot from the Japanese industry, particularly as because Japanese vertical farms are more generally been around for longer, they typically have less automation that goes on. And therefore, the West could probably learn quite a lot in the ways that they have overcome difficulties in addressing labor costs within their facilities. So what does this all mean? Well, vertical farming is still a very rapidly growing industry. It's still in its early stages uh, in the US and Europe, although it's a much more mature industry in Japan. This graph is a simplified forecast from the recent ID TechX report on vertical farming and predicts that the industry will continue to exhibit rapid growth across the U Europe and the US, although the industry will still need to overcome the challenges around business model, pricing, and production costs to make this a reality. Nevertheless, the outlook is bright and more and more talented people are entering the industry every day. And that brings me to the end of, the, of today's presentation, which has hopefully given you a short overview of the state of vertical farming across the world and the contents of this presentation, as well as much more insight into the technologies and market factors that are helping to shape the industry can be found in the recent ID Tech X report, Vertical Farming 2020 to 2030. So uh, that brings me to the end of my presentation. So uh, thank you. Thank <music> you.